Good morning. And welcome to worship. Special welcome to the guests who are here with us today. So glad that you could be here. Today we continue our series, The Need for Followership. You've heard it said that there is a need for good leadership. In the church, our leader is Jesus. And so therefore, uh, we want to consider ways in, in which that we can follow him. You know, a lot of people really want to follow Jesus, though. A lot of people want to lay claim to him and, and claim to understand what the teachings of Jesus really mean. Uh, a lot of people might say that Jesus has come in order to make our lives on earth a whole lot better, as well as life in heaven. And while this is true that God desires what is good for us, he doesn't promise that we are going to experience good times every day of our lives here on earth as we sojourn through. And so we sometimes are tempted to wonder, God, with all of your power, why don't you make my life better? Why don't you take my crosses away? And yet in his word, Jesus invites us to listen and to remember what the true purpose of his power really is. And that in the end, Jesus overthrows every power of Satan and every evil. He crushes them at the foot of the cross, and he invites us to get to hear the good news of our salvation. We begin our worship with the opening hymn found in your blue hymnals, hymn 765. We follow along in our service, uh, in our worship bulletins on page four. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy, Holy God, God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and I have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, the same. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace 
peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. And for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. El Sain, comfort and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you reveal your mighty power chiefly in showing mercy and kindness. Grant us the full measure of your grace that we may obtain your promises and become partakers of your heavenly glory through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. You may be seated. At this time, we invite the children forward for a message. Have you ever, on a sleepless night, looked outside your window and seen lightning and the sound of thunder if you were sleeping soundly before, you weren't after you heard it. It jarred you awake. When I was younger, I was pretty scared of thunderstorms. In fact, sometimes I still am. Haven't experienced very many out here in California yet, though they have a lot of them in Arizona during the summer. You know what my dad used to tell me about thunderstorms to make me less afraid? What are thunderstorms? Thunderstorms in what is out of the stormy sky and when the water goes down in the city. Yeah, they come from the skies and they go down upon the city. That's the long and short of it. That's not what my dad told me. That's not how he explained thunderstorms. He said it's it's the sound of angels bowling in heaven. <laughs> so they got another strike. And in a way, that made me feel a little better because that got me thinking, you know, God is bigger than the storm. God's power is way more powerful than the loud sound that keeps me up at night, right? 
He's bigger than everything. He is pretty big, isn't he? <laughs> yeah. Jesus demonstrates his power in a lot of different ways, and you can see it in nature, whether it's a thunderstorm or earthquakes. And I don't always understand the purpose of a thunderstorm. I don't think I, I really... If you were to ask me, why do we have thunderstorms? I don't know if I could give you a good answer. But Jesus does give us good answer about how he uses his power. He always uses his power to help us because he loves us. You know the most powerful thing that he did at the cross? What did he do for you and me in the world? He, he, he died and covered all of our sins. He forgave all of our sins. He crushed the devil. The devil is maybe the scariest thing there is. And Jesus crushed him at the cross. So if the devil is crushed and storms are all under his control and he can even heal people of their sicknesses, I don't think we have anything to be afraid of. So let's say a prayer about that. Let's fold our hands. Dear Lord, you are almighty God. Thank you for humbling your almighty power and showing your love for us through death. Teach us to see the true purpose of your power. We praise your holy name for the love that you have shown to us. In your name we pray. Amen. The first reading this morning comes from the prophet Isaiah chapter 35. Through the prophet Isaiah, God promised that he would come making the blind see and the lame leap, an amazing demonstration of his power. But the ultimate purpose of his coming was to save us. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear, your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground, bubbling springs. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We open our blue hymnals to sing Psalm 146. I will praise the Lord all my life.
The second reading comes from Acts chapter 3. Christ gave his follower Peter the power to heal a man who was lame from birth, unable to walk. When healed, the man does not go first to family and friends, but to the temple to praise God. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was Today's gospel from Mark chapter 7 also serves as the basis for this morning's sermon. Jesus uses his power not to elicit praise from the crowd, but to demonstrate his love for a man who was deaf and mute. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon, down to the Sea of Galilee, and into the region of the Decapolis. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. After he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Ephetha, which means be open. At this, the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated for the hymn of the day, hymn 769, Your Hand, O Lord, in the Days of Old.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours in abundance from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The word of God for our meditation this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7. In the name of Jesus, who hears our wordless sighs and groans, and who comes to us with help and salvation, my dear Christian friends. If you want something done right, you've had to do, you've better do it yourself. How many of you have had a situation where the plumber did a bad job or someone messed up your patio or a guest out of the goodness of their hearts put the dishes in all the wrong cabinets? So you had to pull up your sleeves and get to work. This is kind of a, a message that no one really had to teach us. I don't, I don't really think anyone had to teach me that message. I think it's just that we live in this world that has a sort of do-it-yourself attitude. So we pull up our sleeves and we get going. After all, it's been said, God helps those who help themselves. Interestingly enough, those words don't actually come from the Bible. They sort of added that little bit there. God helps those who help themselves. What about the people who can't help themselves? If I am blind and the building I'm in catches on fire, I might not find the exit in time. If I'm mute, I wouldn't be able to cry for help. And if I'm deaf, well, I, sure, I, certainly couldn't cry, I, I certainly couldn't hear the fire alarm, and it's probably the case that no one even bothered to tell me what to do in case of a fire, because I wouldn't hear it anyway. In today's Gospel from Mark chapter 7, we see Jesus help a man who, who couldn't help himself. And he preached a sermon that even a deaf man could hear and understand. At, the time of, at this point in his ministry, Jesus' popularity has actually been on the decline. We followed him as his popularity has been ramping up. When he fed the 5,000, the crowds were following him everywhere. But then he stopped feeding them, and he opened his mouth to teach them. And just like the, that, the crowds turned their backs on him. They remained spiritually deaf, not wanting to hear the words of a Savior who is also their Lord and Master. Of course, we also know from the get-go that the Jewish leaders have been opposing Jesus and looking for different ways to accuse him of breaking God's laws, questioning his authority and so forth, but Jesus was undeterred. So after spending a little bit of time with these different Jewish groups, uh, preaching to them and teaching them, he decided to take a bit of a long tour through Gentile territory. And after passing through pagan Tyre and Sidon, which are along the Mediterranean Sea, he makes his way back west and south to the Sea of Galilee and then down into the east side of the Jordan River to the place called the Decapolis, which means the Ten Cities. These are Greek cities full of Gentiles. And Jesus had been there once before, and the people had asked him to leave after he cast a legion of demons into a herd of pigs, which then drowned themselves. They wanted nothing to do with this man. But I guess something changed between then and the time of our reading, because now they're all swarming Jesus and bringing to him people for him to heal. So I suppose word got out among the Gentile groups of this miracle worker, this healer from God. We're told there were some people who brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. We're not really told what this man's story was. We just know that he couldn't hear, and he had a, speaking, a speech impediment. So he could make sounds, but barely anyone could understand what he had to say. And so perhaps we, we can understand a little bit of how difficult life must have been for him. It would have taken a lot of effort for his friends and his loved ones and family just to have a conversation with him. How many conversations did he have that would have ended with frustration? Tossing up with the hands and walking away. 
as opposed when that's the life that you lead, uh, the sermon that you hear from the world would be something along the lines of, don't be a burden to other people. Just try to stay out of their way. If there is a God, you would probably be a burden to him too. Even a deaf man could hear a sermon like that and read it in the behavior of the people in his life, and it would echo within the chambers of his heart. But one day, everyone he knew started acting really strangely. They're, they're talking fast, and they're moving here and there, and suddenly they, they grab his arm, and they take him to meet someone. Could it be a, a, a friend or a distant relative? He doesn't know. But he doesn't want to be a burden to anyone, so you know he goes along with the, with the people, trying to keep pace with the people who are dragging him by the arm. And, and he's brought before Jesus, this rabbi from Nazareth. Meanwhile, Jesus, you know, he's been facing a whole lot of opposition lately. And he's been on a long journey. And actually, the point of his big, long journey was to have some alone time with his disciples in order to instruct them and to prepare them for gospel ministry as his apostles to go out into the world and preach the good news to all creation. He needed time to train these men to, do, to be that. So if I were Jesus, I would probably be getting a little annoyed with all of the slowdowns and all the people who are bringing their, their sick to me and giving me these big brown puppy dog guys saying, oh, please, wouldn't you help me? I'm trying to help my disciples here. None of this made the, the deaf and mute man seem any less of a burden. So if I were Jesus, I would have just wanted to treat the situation dispassionately as quickly as possible. I could do what the people expected of me and just simply place my hand on the man, let him be healed, and let the people be wowed, and then get on with my day with another notch in my belt. This man, another number in a list of miracles that may or may not be recorded in the annals of Scripture. Yet, even though Jesus was not all that interested in entertaining the crowds, his heart did go out to this man, this individual, this handicapped Gentile nobody from the Decapolis. So what does he do? He takes the man by the hand, leads him away from his friends and family so that it's just the two of them. And there are no distractions. One-on-one, -on -one, this man with his Savior you know, I would hazard to guess that as a deaf man, first of all, as a Gentile, he would not have heard the words of Scripture read to him. He would not have known about a Savior from sin. But then, of course, as a deaf man, no one probably would have even bothered to tell him. But here he is, face to face, with his Savior who loves him. And Jesus makes a concerted effort to communicate very clearly with this man. And he preaches to him a sermon without using any words. So the man's eyes are fixed on Jesus. And the first thing that Jesus does is he puts his fingers in the man's ears as if to say, I'm going to make your ears better. I'm going to help your hearing. Then Jesus spits. Spitting is something that the, only the tongue can do. You can't really spit without your tongue. As if to say, and then he touches the man's mouth as if to say, I'm going to turn this faulty tongue into a tongue that works better than anyone. But the sermon doesn't stop there. Before he speaks his word of healing to the man, and the man is, still has his eyes fixed on Jesus, Jesus lifts his eyes heavenward as if to tell the man a sermon that he never would have heard from the people in his life. That you have a Savior and he is from heaven. And this gift you are about to receive comes from the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. 
your Savior. And then Jesus lets out a deep sigh. The sigh is like a prayer, almost as if to say, God has heard every sigh of exasperation and every groan of frustration in your day-to-day living. He knows your needs, and now he is here to provide for them in ways you never could have imagined. For every good and perfect gift comes from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. You have a God, and to him you are not a burden. To him you are beloved, and he wants to make you his own, to wash your sins away, and to give you healing. Even a sigh or a groan is a prayer that your, that your Savior hears. So, fear not. God has come to you to give you good news of great joy. And Jesus opens his mouth and he utters the word in, in Aramaic, Ephetha, which means be opened. And immediately we're told his ears were opened and he was hearing sounds. He probably, that was the first word that he heard. And then we're told that the the chains that were fettering his tongue down were loosened. Suddenly, he was able to talk plainly, not incompletely. This wasn't an incomplete miracle, like he, he could kind of hear a little bit better, and he's starting to be able to speak like a baby. Any of you who have ever had a baby before know that it takes time for a baby to practice with words in order to speak properly like an adult. This man needed no practice. He had been set free. His tongue was loosed and he was speaking like any of the people that he had seen speaking to him throughout his life. Never again would he have difficulty communicating his thoughts with the people he loves. Never again would he, would he have difficulty understanding what was going on in his life. Now he could communicate in ways that he never would have imagined possible for him. And this complete and total healing was a gift that came from heaven. A gift from God. And this Jesus is the Son of God. Come to me. This display of power, of course, left no doubt in the minds of the people that Jesus was the promised Messiah. Of course, we've become well aware at this point that their conception of what the Messiah ought to be was pretty far off base. They believed the Messiah was someone who has come to establish a kingdom on earth a paradise, a utopia, a new Eden to take, to run out those Roman oppressors and to give everyone free food and free health care forever. That's why the 5,000, the crowd of 5,000 followed Jesus everywhere. They wanted him to become their bread king. The people would have been very happy if Jesus had stayed with them and continued performing miracles and healing people, but that was not the purpose for Jesus' power. His primary task was to live as a perfect substitute for all people and to sacrifice himself on the cross for the forgiveness of all people's sins. So when the Son of God would bring his saving work to completion, he would not left a, he never leaves a good thing half finished or undone. Christ would not be deterred by the opposition he would meet or by the weak faith that he would experience on the way. No, he would go to Jerusalem to meet with the Jews and the Gentiles who were there to arrest him and to put him on the cross. And there upon the cross, he would lift up his eyes heavenward once more and utter another simple one-word sermon, tatalistai, which in the Greek means it is finished. In other words, there is nothing you need to do to complete your salvation. It is finished. It's done. It's accomplished. Your sins have been covered by the blood of the Lamb. Have you ever felt as though you and your life are nothing more than a burden? Have you ever felt like nothing more than a number? Just another nameless, individual background character in the grand scheme of human history. Like the crowds in the Decapolis, do you find it 
easy to marvel at the love of Jesus, but difficult to chew and swallow his words, to truly listen to what he has to say. I may come to church regularly and hear gospel-rich sermons that Jesus offers to us through his word and through his sacraments, yet so often in my brokenness, I'm tempted to think that God doesn't care about me personally because day by day, I experience all these various hurts and struggles and I feel isolated. When you feel isolated or unloved and you're tempted to resent God for the crosses that he puts in your life, don't listen to the sermon that your sinful flesh is preaching to you. You're not just some number. You're not just the first act in, 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 a, in Jesus' three-ring three circus. Your Savior understands every way in which you suffer. He knows every way in which you are tempted. He sees your sins, and he doesn't get exasperated with you. He doesn't get annoyed. He sighs. And he prays to the Father on your behalf, his heart overflowing with love and compassion. He has made you innocent by his blood because he has redeemed you, purchased and won you not with gold and silver, but with the blood of God himself, which alone can cover the sins of the world. And because God sees Jesus' blood upon you, he passes over you with wrath and punishment. The difficulties that you experience in this life are not a punishment for your sins, but rather they are a way for God's glory to be manifested in your life. He gives you faith to trust in him when he speaks to you gently in a personal sermon through his word. And he points your eyes crossword through when he gives you his body and his blood for the forgiveness of your sins. Through his word, he lifts our eyes heavenward. Jesus looks at the sin that besets us, the sins we commit. He sighs, he doesn't get annoyed, he sympathizes, he forgives. He motivates us to share that kind of love and patience with other people. You may have known people who, who, who are hard of hearing or who couldn't speak, and you might have given up quickly trying to communicate with them. And we know that Jesus doesn't promise from Scripture that he's going to heal a pers every person's hearing or seeing in this life. And he also doesn't promise to give us the power to be able to heal other people the way that he did. But he does promise us something better. And he gives us something that we can share even with people who are unable to hear. We're able to preach sermons to people who are deaf. You might wonder, what could I say to a deaf person? I think, you more than, I think you know more than you think you know. If you don't remember, let me remind you. Jesus loves you. That's sign language. This is something that you could say even to someone who can't hear. I may not understand what's going on in your life. I may not be able to sympathize with every difficulty you've had to carry. But I can say one thing with certainty. Jesus loves you because Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Yes, Jesus is strong to save. He is able to heal and to give sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf, and speech to the mute. But as for me, his grace is sufficient. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Amen. The peace of God that transcends all human understanding will guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand as we join to confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed found at the bottom of page
Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God and Mary's Son, in the fullness of time you came into our world to save us from sin and death. Beloved Son of the Father, revered by the Magi, baptized by John, you came preaching and teaching, healing and comforting, forgiving and encouraging. Prince of Peace, shine like a beacon for us and the people of our world. Let the good news of salvation be heard in the remotest corners of the earth. Open our lips to speak your name to those around us who still live in, without faith or hope. Lord of the Church, let your peace rule our hearts that we may use our gifts to serve you and each other in willing gratitude and joy. Watch over our loved ones near and far that they may remember your love and rejoice in your salvation. Strengthen the faith of the sick and the disheartened. Today, we especially pray for Bill Temple. Remembering him in his sickness, we pray that you may restore him to health. Give him the patience to bear up under this continued hardship of getting sick with a faith that looks to you for needed strength. Lord Almighty, you call and console your people with the powerful words, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. Comfort and encourage Claudia Jorgensen, who was recently diagnosed with cancer, Brittany Shryak, her husband Jamie, and, and be also with their baby, as Brittany is having difficulty swallowing and might need a medical procedure for the good of their child. And we pray that you continue to be with the family of Porter Goforth, who continues to struggle with heart and lung issues. Assure each of them that the waters of trouble will not sweep over them. In your good time, bring them relief from all of their troubles. Use this severe trial to turn their attention to your great promises that they may find strength in you as they wait for your deliverance. Gracious Lord, healer of diseases, we praise you for blessing Yua Hang, the mother of Zhu Yang, with recovery from after five months of being in hospice care. We give thanks that you provided both physical and spiritual strength during her time of affliction. Please continue to empower Yua and her daughter Ju to glorify your name each and every day. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. Finally, bring us and all your believers to the heavenly home where we will stand in the full light of your glory and with all your saints and angels sing the everlasting song of triumph. We join together to pray with the words that our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
we pray. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Thank you.